I don't think it would have happened the same way without Tony, you know. I mean, I think that he, he dominated it and his personality dominated it and everybody knew him as the public face of fact because he was on the telly and he was reading the news and everything around here. Um, and, you know, he had his Granada programmes where he got the pistols on and Elvis Costello. And everyone was seeing Elvis Costello, you know, on the regional opt-out news, Granada reports, whatever, doing Alison on his own. You thought, well, bloody hell, you know, that's marvellous. Um, and I think... Um, you know, uh, Tony is a kind of uh, um, just one of those figureheads. I think you need for a great label, really. You know, I mean, and and that he, you know, viewed it all as some kind of um, art house prank, really. You know, claims to come from this situationist kind of background and approach to it all. You know, um, and um, a lot of people dismissed him. You know, as a pretentious wanker. I remember going. I remember going down there and seeing um, Simple Minds and U2 in at the same time. I remember seeing Jim Kerr in there uh, and all that. But I mean, no, you used to see um, the people who were there. Were like, you know, uh, you'd see obviously the new order guys from time to time. Certain ratio people. They were hanging around a lot. You know, um, seems to remember jazz and, and uh, Donald Johnson, who was a fantastic drummer. With the ratios, they were knocking around. Um, Vinnie Riley was probably there, but you wouldn't have been able to see him. He'd been hiding under a chair. Um, you know, uh, so um, there were people like that about, I think, you know. Uh, I don't know, it all blurs into one a, bit, a bit, really, you know. Hacienda, I mean, I think, I, I think in, uh, I, that I was member number 15 of the Hacienda. I could be wrong, but it was pretty early on because Tony gave, it was like me and Stuart, who were obviously playing their records. And and, and um, they gave us these car these little cards. I think they were grey. They certainly had the black and yellow edging on, you know that kind of industrial sheet which became very cliched. And, and again, you know, they were one of the first to adopt that really. And and it's still a style you see all over the place. Um, and so we were, you know, um, aware of it opening. And when we first went down, we thought it was bloody awful because it was this big cold space and people weren't really going. People were only going at the beginning. Um, to um, to see what if there was a good band on, so like New Order played, and the, you know, and it became apparent it was a terrible place to see a band because the acoustics were diabolical. It w it was just you you know a big echoing metallic box. Um, it was a DJ booth and a low stage, and so you could see from the dance floor. But then the dance floor, the, you know, if you were in the other two thirds, you couldn't see at all. You could go upstairs. There was a balcony, a kind of metallic gantry but it was only about two or three deep so again you couldn't really see you couldn't see or well you could hear but it sounded terrible you know Martin Allen made these things where the drums and the bass were really locked right in front of your eyes and then the, the guitars and the vocals and everything kind of faded in and, and peeped from behind these great blocks of rhythm which I think influenced the way a lot of records were made you know I know certainly Bono and U2 were really kind of you know even though you'd think U2 don't sound much like George but in the early days they, they had, you know were really influenced by Martin and I know that to be true um, yeah, because um, Bono told me that when he came to Manchester because you know when U2 were just starting on Island Records and I had the indie show and so they used to come on my show quite regularly but my favourite story about Martin Hanna is with, um, with, he was producing a record for a band, a little-known Manchester band, The Freshies, Chris Seavey, who became Frank Sidebottom, a comedian Frank Sidebottom. And they had a minor hit with I'm, I'm in love with the girl on the Virgin Megastore checkout desk. And um, Martin didn't produce that one, but he produced a record for them. And um, uh, Martin turned up to do the record, and they're in the studio, and uh, they started playing it, and it came time to mix it. And Martin said, uh, right, I'm off now. And he said, well, you've not mixed the record. And he said, mm, we all got to go. And you know, he said, well, you're supposed to be mixing the record. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, just fade, put all the faders in a straight line, on just medium, halfway up like that, and, and run it through. So they said, all right, then, you know. So Martin Hannett went and they set all the faders like that, ran it through to the masters. And uh, do you know what? It sounded absolutely shite. 